Hello, and welcome back to another video. Today, we're going to talk about something a little bit more different from my usual videos, which are just me analysing different unassisted translations. Instead, I've culminated hundreds and hundreds of uh, hours of research and tens, if not hundreds, of different studies into one project, and I'll be discussing slash giving my own evidence-backed opinion on Virgil's stance on the Augustan regime as presented in the Aeneid. Disclaimer, I'm by no means a classic scholar, I'm just a middle school student who's way too interested in dead Romans. Um, I have just read a lot of evidence that other classic scholars have pr provided and put it together into one video. Hope you enjoy. The Aeneid, up to the 1950s and 60s, had been thought as purely a piece of political propaganda for Augustus to increase his gut grasp on the entire social hierarchy of the newly founded Roman Empire. Upon first glance, this is obviously the case. Each time the name of Augustus or the lineage of Caesar is mentioned in the Aeneid, it is always surrounded by nothing but praise. Uh, experts of the classics of the 20th century, for example Otis and Avery, have all pointed out in their separate studies on this topic that Virgil, without a shadow of a doubt, was not only simply commissioned to glorify Augustus as a future leader of Rome, but also believed firmly himself that that was the truth. Otis, especially in his published study, um, A Study in Civilized Poetry, stated that Virgil really saw Augustus as the type of man who could bring peace. He really believed in his ideology. Another respected classic scholar of the 20th century, William Avery, commented that Virgil's close relationship to Augustus and his admiration, and perhaps even personal fondness for him, drove Virgil to wrote, write in such a way as well. And these studies should not go amiss. It's very intuitive from all evidence gathered that Virgil will be a true pro-Augustan poet. The first appearance of the name of Caesar is um, line 286 of Book 1 of the Aeneid. Here we can see the technique of synchesis being used, uh, Pocra agreeing with Origine and Trojanus agreeing with Caesar. Uh, the rough translation or more literal translation of this passage that I've just come up with uh, goes as such. Uh, from this graceful origin, Trojan Caesar will be born, who will extend his power to the ocean and fame to the stars. Julius, a name sent down from great Eulus. Eulus referring to Ascanius, Aeneas' son. From the diction in this short passage, we can see that Virgil's literary description of Caesar is extremely positive and very reflective of typical propaganda language. The second appearance of the name of Caesar is line 791 of Book 6 of the Aeneid, where Aeneas visits the underworld to talk to his father, uh, Anchises. Anchises provides a pageant of Rome's future and descendants of Aeneas, and of course, eventually reaches Augustus Caesar. This passage is roughly translated as such. This is the man, this is him, who was promised to you, whom you hear about so often. Augustus Caesar, born of the gods, who will bring back the golden age of Saturn to Latium. These are obviously very big promises that are given as a propaganda technique by Virgil, and glorifies Augustus to an extreme extent. Um, another common theme with not just Roman, but any ancient culture with regards to being an heir to the throne. As with Chinese and ancient Romans, the concept of blood and origin of birth is extremely important in determining who has the right to rule. It's often less about military power and more about the divinity right, the divine right to the throne, and thus Augustus' understanding of this fact uh, wanted to portray himself to be in line with the great heroes of Roman civilization by linking himself to Aeneas, who was the son of Venus, meaning he was ultimately a descendant of Jupiter, the king of the gods. The third and last appearance of Caesar is line 678 to 681 of Book 8. And because my translation sounded a bit off here and uh, wouldn't make much literal sense, I employ the translation of uh, Dylan Macaulay, who is someone much more qualified and better at this than me, in his study about this topic named Eulogy for the Republic, Virgil's Anti-Augustan Longing for the Roman Republic in the Aeneid. 
in which he translated this section as leading Italy into battle with the Senate, the people, the city's penates, and all the great gods, stood Caesar Augustus on his ship's high stern, a double flame licking his temples, and above his head shone his father's star. Again, portraying Augustus almost in parallel uh, with Aeneas, who was the ultimate model of Virgilian and Augustan Roman heroism. However, if we now take a turn, let's analyse all the evidence suggesting Virgil's silent disapproval for the Augustan regime. In Say by Grieve, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, her study, she commented that during Jupiter's listing of Aeneas' lineage, um, that Virgil selects only kings. He omits the famous Romans of the Republican period. This may be Virgil's way of implying that Augustus is a king himself, and so this aims at reminding the reader of the absence of the Roman Republic. James O'Hara also states that this may be Virgil indicating his choiceless trust in Augustus to better Rome, but also portraying his deep fear that the Rep Republic would have been better after all. This is also seen in Book 8 on the Shield of Aeneas, where Augustus marching into battle had the people and senate on his side. Uh, this may be Virgil's hint that a leader cannot be successful without the aid of his people and the Senate, which may serve as this silent reminder to the people that Augustus now was unlike a consul of the Republic. He has everything he needs to rule with an iron fist without the Senate's consent. Virgil's disapproval of Augustus may also be his silent critiquing of Augustus as a leader, while most scholars in favour of Virgil's pro-Augustan stance may portray his image on Aeneas' shield to be in praise of Augustus' military power and success, it is very much possible that Virgil puts the Battle of Actium, in which Octavian defeated Mark Antony right in the centre of the shield, to emphasise his security of power through bloodshed and not divine right. David Quint argues that Virgil purposefully emphasises points in the Aeneid where it was obvious Augustus would use the epic to put down his opposition, which was believed by Virgil to some extent to be impious and unroman. As early as Book 1, Carthage was introduced as philanthropic and prosperous, as described by Macaulay, and so because of its good government and laws. Dido, the Queen of Carthage, is also portrayed as a capable leader who is reminiscent of the leaders of the Roman Republic. However, Francis Cairns describes Dido to have deteriorated rapidly following her meeting with Aeneas, seemingly symbolising the approach of Augustus to have been the cause of the Republic's destruction and the end of Rome's prosperity. This was a necessary step for Aeneas to take, however, so as to secure himself as a good king and leader. This critique of Augustus by comparing the Republic to Dido is subtle and is simply a possibility, but thought-provoking nonetheless. In conclusion, although the paper Macaulay published on the exact topic provided the conclusion that Virgil was almost certainly hiding something, it is my personal belief that there is simply not enough evidence presented in the Aeneid to come to a full conclusion that would reach anywhere close to certainty. Macaulay ended his paper which was in-depth and extremely thorough, by commenting that it is likely that on his deathbed, Virgil realised that in the Empire his work could never be honest enough to harm Augustus, and that contributing praise to the Emperor in any capacity had been a grave error, to the point that destroying it was his only remaining choice. Regardless of its truth, it is simply intriguing to think about the level of sophistication that would have gone into Aeneas' writing, Virgil's lifeblood, whether he succeeded in delivering his message in silence in an era of dictatorship or not, it is of no doubt that his work has contributed to millennia of debate and thought, and his success as a literary genius can never be doubted. Thank you for listening.